welcome. I am calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, September 12, 2022. I am Select Board Chair Linda Diggins, and I will now confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diana Hahn? Here. John Hurd? Yes. Steve Corsi? Yes. Eric Helmuth? Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Sandy Pooler? Here. Doug Heim? Here. Ashley Meyer? Here. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a hybrid format, consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, signed into law on July 17, 2022, which further extends certain COVID-19 measures regarding mobile remote participation. The Act includes an extension until March 31, 2023, of uh, the remote meeting provisions of Governor, Governor Baker's original March 12, 2020, executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is on the town's website in reference with agenda materials for this meeting, allow public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as there is a reasonable access that allows the public to follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. It is being recorded and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on HCMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on Tom's website using the agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. So let's see how much of the town's business we can get tonight, get done tonight. I think we can get it all done. And, um, and, and next on the agenda is the land acknowledgement. I would like to read the acknowledgement, the land acknowledgement that the board supported in the spring of 2021 and that was adopted at the 2021 annual town meeting. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous people from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. Now, before we turn to item number three on the agenda, please note that the continued appeal of the denial of the removal of the tree at 261 Hillside will be conducted as a hearing. That is, comments from residents as well as others will be heard when we get to that item on the agenda rather than during open forum. So now we'll move on to item number three on tonight's agenda, which is the Hunger Action Day proclamation. And, and I think we have someone um, here, Andy, perhaps, I mean, that is going to speak to that item. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi, I'm Andy Dome, the Executive Director of Arlington Eats, and uh, I appreciate you guys um, taking the opportunity tonight to um, declare September 23rd as Hunger Action uh, Day. Um, we, of course, know that many of our fellow neighbors um, do struggle with food insecurity, and so it's important that as a community we acknowledge that and we also take action uh, in a variety of ways to, um, to reduce and eliminate hunger and food insecurity in our communities. Well, thank you, Andy. And so, colleagues? Move. Approval? Second. All right, so on a motion by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mrs. Mahan. And, um, I, um, I had a plan and, and I just lost my connection. So Mrs. Mahan, if you can, thank you, appreciate that. No so on a motion and to, uh, as, as, on a motion to approve and a second uh, by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mrs. Mahan, and I want to, say that we now therefore be it resolved me that the town of Arlington encourages any residents in need of food to call Arlington Eats at 339-707-6761 or visit arlingtoneats.org and resolve that the town of Arlington encourages residents to support efforts to alleviate food insecurity by volunteering and donating money or food when they are able and resolve that September 23rd, 2022 shall be proclaimed as a Hunger Action Day in Arlington and that all residents are encouraged to take cognizance of this event and participate fittingly in its observance. So on that, we'll take a vote. Uh, Mr. Heim? Mr. Hurd? Yes. 
Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Helmet. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. I'm sorry. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Diggins. Yes. It's thank a five you. zero vote. So thank you, Andy, and, and good luck with everything and good work on, on this, uh, this important cause. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So next on the agenda um, is the consent agenda. Uh, so request contracted rain layer license, Monica Payment, Emily Saka, 101 Cambridge Street, Burlington, MA, 0201803. Five request special one day beer and wine license, September 17th, 2022 at Arlington Reservoir for Arlington Town Day, the 5K race, Brian Burke, Burke Alewhite, Aleworks, and then number six, Request special one day beer and wine license, 9 22 at Robbins Memorial Town Hall for a private event. Amin Humphrey, Arab Uni, Armenian School. So on the consent agenda. Move approval, Mr. Chair. Second. Okay, on uh, a uh, motion to approve by Mr. Helmuth and a second by Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hurd. <laughs> I just did that to test you. <laughs> yeah, no problem, no problem. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, We'll see. You know, so uh, with that, you know, Mr. Heim? Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Thank you. So now we move to item number seven, a public hearing on uh, betterment, a road betterment, and that is Governor Road Betterment, and it's a request to repair private way, a betterment or order, and, and we have Sheila Con Connor. Connor G. Connerney. Connerney. All right, thank you. Uh, Sheila? Hi, um, I'm a resident here at uh, 23 Governor Road in Arlington and um, asking uh, to have a repair done for our private way. Um, we found a contractor, and I think we're just waiting for the town to say that we can go forward with the project. All right, thank you. Sheila, so um, this is going to be a public hearing, I mean, and so uh, if there is anyone you know, in the audience I mean, that is here to speak to that, uh, please raise your hand electronically. I don't have my screen up, so I don't know if anyone's raised Yeah, hands. yeah, I mean, I lost my connection, I mean, so, so I can't see either. Seeing no hands, Len. All right, thank you, Ashley. So um, there is no one here to say anything one way or another. So Mr. Hurd. It's nice to see unanimous consent. The road must be in tough shape. Move approval. It is. And a second by. Second. <laughs> so on a motion to approve by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. Helmut. Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Helm. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. To all the H's. Yes. <laughs> I know. Mr. D. It's quite a mouthful. <laughs> yes. Thank, cool. thank you. Thank you. So, good luck with your road betterment, uh, Ms. Um, Prinarni. Yep. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah. So next is open forum. Except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy rules under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to, pre to present a concern or a request. And so, so um, do we have anyone in open forum? And also I just want to remind you that if you have anything you want to say regarding the, the um, appeal of the tree removal, we're going to have that in, in so it may actually be the next item. So um, anyone in the open forum? Seeing no hands raised. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, the reason I said it's gonna be next it is because it, I've been notified that uh, the, there's a, a bit of a, a emergency, I mean, that means the person that was gonna present for the DEI update is not able to join us tonight. I mean, so we will be moving on now. I mean, to- Should we table that or? Oh. Move to table. Second. All right, so on a move to table by Ms. Mahan and a second by Mr. Hurd. <laughs> Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hyde. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. Thank you. Let's vote. 
Thank you. Hope everything's okay. And so now we move on to the appeal of the tree warden decision uh, regarding the non-removal of a honey locust tree at 261 Hillside Avenue. Um, and this appeal is by Rob and Eileen Gainforth. And so where do we start on this? I mean, so where we left off we, was we continued this from our previous meeting in order to work out how we could go about um, accommodating in the request to remove the tree. And, and so I think what I'm going to do now is, is turn it over to Mr. Heim, and if he has any comments, I think I saw maybe you beckoning to say something, and, and then um, go over to um, Mr. Helmus for maybe an update you know, um, on his look, his research, for lack of a better word, into the issue, and then maybe to the tree warden. You know, so, so I see motioning over to my colleague, Ian, and so okay. would you like me to go to Mr. Helmuth first? Mr. Mr. No. Chair, I'm very happy. Mr. Heim, okay. if he has, if he has. A... No, Mr. Chair, I, I just wanted, the board had several questions uh, for me that I wanted to make sure that all board members had the sort of answers to those questions before you had any further deliberation or considered further testimony or discussion of the matter. So uh, let me just sort of lay the groundwork. For this. As an initial matter, um, with respect to planting a replacement tree, we already include in the fee for public shade tree removal, the removal of the tree and then planting a replacement tree that is part of our current system and our sort of rules and regulations as it stands. So you can't, it is as a matter of course that if you cut down a public shade tree uh, through an appeal or otherwise, that a uh, replacement tree has to be planted. Uh, second thing, there was a question about whether or not the replacement tree had to go in the tree belt or whether or not you could have something called a setback tree. And the answer is yes, you can. You can have a setback tree. Um, to be very frank with the board in terms of the ups and downs of this, a setback tree is essentially a tree that's put on private property but treated like a public shade tree by the town. Um, I'd be curious to see if the tree warden had any particular insight or perspective about care of a setback tree because it's not as if a setback tree is ordinarily subject to an easement or quite as formally um, sort of codified so that it runs with the land in the way other types of things might be. Uh, third, there was um, a little bit of discussion um, offline, not between members of the board, but uh, I saw some feedback uh, from the board's previous discussion about some of the requirements. I do want to affirm some of those so that there is a 20 foot width limitation in the bylaw for any driveways. You can't have a driveway that's wider than 20 feet. Similarly, I know that one person wrote in about the type of relief that would be required if you were to put in a second driveway. And it is correct that in order to put a second driveway in under the zoning bylaw, you would have to get relief from the Zoning Board of Appeals. So whether the Zoning Board of Appeals would or wouldn't grant relief in this particular case, I don't feel uh, qualified to say, um, but I just want folks to understand the sort of basic legal framework um, while we're talking about it if you're going to have one of drivers. I see Mr. Hurd already has a hand. Well, I just want to clarify. So, because I've done this before. So isn't it the curb cut can't be more than 20 feet, not the actual driveway? I will double check on that, but I believe. My understanding is that the curb cut can't be more than 20 feet, but your actual driveway can be more than 20 feet. And I mean, I guess this would be a building decision, but there's a lot all over town. These drivers exist where, and I have one that's next to a driveway that goes down and the building department when we put it in considered it one driveway. So it's not a second drive. A second driveway is a second cur curb cut. And then just at the time, and I could be wrong, but it's my understanding that the curb cut limit is 20 feet, not the width of the driveway. I'll confirm that, Mr. Hurt. <coughs> that's it, Mr. Hurt? Uh, that's the that's the sort of basic ground rules that I sort of wanted to be responsive to your questions. I'll follow up. Uh, I'll pull up the zoning bylaw and confirm that it's uh, defined specifically by the curb cut, as opposed to the width of a driveway at a later point in time. Uh, but um, that's the sort of basics that I wanted to go over. Just the board understood its posture and options. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Hine. And so, any questions regarding what Ms. Hine said? Right. So, Mr. Helms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually have a, a clarifying question for Mr. Hyman. I know he's trying to look something up. Um, 
and most of my comments, I think, are, are going to be further questions because I think I, the work I have done is kind of narrowed down what some of the issues might be. Um, the first is just to, uh, to confirm that I heard you correctly, Mr. Hyman, that if, if the uh, residents were trying to add a second, drive, that tr second driveway, that would require a special permit, but not necessarily if they were just seeking to expand the present driveway as long as they were com complying with the curb cut? Correct. Um, and at some point in this process, Mr. Chair, I hope that, you know, I presume we'll give the, um, the residents a chance to make further comments to us um, in response to this discussion. And maybe one of us can remember to, to check in with them about, about that to make sure that that's the plan. Yeah. Um, the second question is, I, I know that we have uh, Mr. Lequeev, our tree warden, uh, available as a panelist tonight. Um, as, as well as Mr. Gainford, I believe, is one of the, one of the residents. So they're just for my colleagues. They're here tonight if we, if we need them. Um, and what a question I have that is probably both in the purview of Mr. Lequeev and Mr. Heim is when it comes to the tree bylaw and interpretation interpretation of that. If the select board grants the removal of a tree. Um, there is a requirement or you know, there's contributions to the tree fund or, or the residents can arrange for the replacement of an equivalent uh, diameter at breast height DBH tree. Can that be more than one tree or does it need to be a single tree you know, with the 18? That's something I would want to defer to Mr. Lequeve on in terms of what his, in, in his judgment would be a sufficient, um, or Mr. Pooler, but I. Yeah, and, and actually, and Mr. And Mr. Mr. Uh, Tom Manager, you, you know some things about this, and I, and I apologize, I did not give you a chance to make any comments about this or anything else, so please, please do, in your uh, experience. Um, I, uh, I will defer to Mr. Lequeed, because I do see he's up here, uh, and I don't know the answer to your question otherwise. That's a sign of a good leader. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, if, uh, Mr. Chair, at your discussion, if we could ask Mr. Lequeed. Yes, yes. In fact, me, me, you feel free to try handle this part of the meeting. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Lequeeve, if you're, if you're uh, uh, here and, and can speak, uh, if you could just speak to the issue of um, should the board decide uh, to allow this? And, and I want to say that I want to listen carefully to all the public comments to follow before really declaring a position on this. But just so we know what our options are, should, should the board decide this, what would the tree bylaw require of, of the residents um, with regard to uh, under the tree bylaw for replacement or contributions to the tree fund. Yep, absolutely. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Tim Lequeve. I'm the Arlington Town Tree Warden. Um, nice to see folks, and um, thanks for having me. This is um, this is great, and it's really important and um, outstanding to have um, community involvement as well. Uh, so, to answer your question, um, if the select board does permit removal, uh, Chapter 87 um, under uh, Massachusetts general law, uh, which uh, pertains specifically to uh, public shade trees. And these are trees that are growing in the public right of way. Um, so this 18 inch uh, honey locust, if it's permitted to be removed, um, the requester would be responsible to remove the tree, grind the stump below grade, and to replace the DBH inches. So what that means is that it's 18 inch. So there's a combination. So it could be planting trees in the public right of way, in the vicinity where it comes down, or paying into the Trees Please Fund. And the town of Arlington has a value at $375 per DBH inch. So you could do a combination of planting and paying into the Trees Please Fund, or one or the other. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to plant one tree at 18 inch. That would be extremely difficult and extremely expensive. So that could be broken up. So most shade trees that you purchase in a nursery are typically around two inches. So uh, there's an opportunity, uh, or, or maybe even three inches, depending on if you can fit that in the tree belt um, on site. Um, so that could be a combination of multiple two inch trees or paying into the trees please fund. So it would be a combination or one or the other. Thank you. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and as a, a follow-up to that, uh, I know that you're familiar with the site in question. Um, in your opinion, um, and I know uh, based, based on some, of, some previous reading that you know, it's, there's a question of interpretation of, of the state statute about where these replacement trees can go. 
Um, so this may invoke Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Pooler, Mr. Heim. But in your opinion, is there what kind of space or availability would, would there be for replacement trees that would that would reach the 18-inch DBH equivalent? And you know, right. where they can so, go might be the question for Mr. Heim. I think I could answer that question. Um, please, please, I could ask yeah. Scott, and, and perhaps uh, Council could uh, piggyback um, off of the um, off of my statement. But um, um, so basically, it, it needs to be immediate inches replaced, uh, not long term. Um, it would be immediate. So, for instance, um, this is a corner lot, so there's room on the corner of George Street itself and on um, Hillside Ave. So let's just hypothetically just say, maybe we could, if, 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 if this is just, um, you know, in, in retrospect, perhaps three trees could be planted on one, um, on, on George Street, let's say three trees at two inch, let's say another three inch out front on Hillside, that's another six inch. You add those up, that's 12 inches. Um, so then there would have to be an additional either trying to plant in the vicinity, um, which would be difficult to have folks on board about accepting some plants. Um, and then also it could be a combination of paying that into the trees please fund, that $375 per inch. So when I've worked with um, folks in the past, um, we try to do our best to replenish the canopy. Um, and if that is just impossible, then there's a payment into the trees please fund I take those funds and I try to saturate that area as best I can to replant in the public right of way. Um, so it's not just replacing um, inches for long term; it's it's immediate. Thank you. That's that's <laughs> glad you that clarification. That's very helpful. Um, let me just make sure I'm not the problem here. So um, I believe Mr. Heim had a comment. Yes, yeah, Mr. Helmuth. I, I think that part of your question was also about. I'm sorry, man, Mr. Chair. Yes. I think part of your question was also about whether or not the it had to be specifically within the tree belt. And what I was trying to uh, note earlier was that under Chapter 87, Section 7, you can um, plant what's considered public shade trees within the setback, which is a 20-foot area, with the written consent of a homeowner. Mm -hmm. So it is possible to plant a tree and have it be considered a public shade tree, even though it's on private property. There's some logistical things about that that are a little bit more complicated in terms of like you know, 20 years from now, does everybody know that it's a public shade tree? Um, and how you would sort of codify that and pass that information on going mm -hmm. forward. Uh, but that's a, another piece of it, in addition to what Mr. Lequeve, I think, is mostly talking about, which is the actual public way layout itself. Um, do we know, uh, Mr. Town, oh, no, what's that? Did you no, have I a question related to this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, all right. Sorry, okay. I just had a question. Okay. 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 okay, all right. I didn't know if it was related, that's why. Oh, yeah. It is related, but okay. I don't want to take this yeah. time. Do, do we do we know um, this may be for the town manager um, if we if there is an established practice of Arlington doing public shade trees in you know a private setback tree does that create any difficulties in terms of our operating? I'm, so, yes. I'm not aware that that is our practice. Yeah, Mr. I don't know if Mr. Lequeve, I, I, I'm not aware of any uh, agreements that we've had in any recent history for setback trees. Uh, but sure. Is, so, if I may, um, yes. I can uh, answer this question. Please. So, in my um, tenure here um, as tree warden for the last six years or so, um, we have not planted um, any trees in the setback. Um, the town um, is working with um, the Arlington Tree Committee to see if that is a possibility, um, because this uh, kind of piggybacks off of our um, Arlington Tree Bylaw, Article 16. Um, protecting trees during builds. So we are trying to find out different avenues to replant. Uh, sometimes uh, trees are removed on a private way and that impacts the neighborhood. And how can we replace trees in a public right of way? Um, we haven't gotten um, quite as far as finalizing exactly what we can do. Uh, but just to answer your question, we have not been planting um, any trees in the um, in a setback area. Um, public works directors just um, needs to work out all the legal um, uh, requirements, uh, having uh, public uh, folk planting on private land, or perhaps having um, public funds B 
being able to be used on private land and having outside contractors doing the work in the planting. So this isn't finalized yet, but it is a concept that we are working on. So for a long winded answer, we have not been planting in the setback. No, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cleveland. I'm very, very nearly done. I think one, one thing I just like to, I have been talking to people about this and I think frame my questions or my, my findings in search of questions, because I think that's the questions we need to be asking. Finally, I think in Mr. Mr. Pooler, Mr. Heim, if I have understand correctly, what you've told us, we had discussed in the last meeting, you know, do we need to kind of do a novel mechanism like an MOU? And it, it sounds to me that the, between the state law and a tree bylaw, that there's a mechanism in place that would require the activity for, you know, for planting equivalent diameters of the trees and other mitigation like that. And I don't know if you have any comment on that, either of you for, for that interpretation or that, that approach. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, that's, that's correct. So what other things that the board expressed, it's very clear that we can essentially try to recover through various different means, the diameter breast height of the tree. Now, some people might want to discuss what that means substantively, but we can require replacement tree planting or as Mr. Lequeve outlined, sufficient funds be donated, not donated, be put into the trees please fund to plant trees elsewhere. The board has that ability now. The other thing the board asked about was whether or not it had to be essentially in the tree belt. And the answer to that is no, although we haven't in recent years had any setback tree plantings. And then finally the board asked about whether or not we would condition something like a pervious driveway on approval. And I haven't found anything that suggests that that's at least an ordinary or tested principle related to public shade tree hearings. That might be something that's more conventional for a ZBA to put on as a condition of a special permit if that was required here. I understand that, again, one of the things that we're all struggling with is there isn't necessarily a finished plan or an application for something. So without seeing a specific plan, it's not easy to figure out like what the, you know, width of something is and all that kind of stuff. So that I think that that is overall a correct recitation of the board's abilities. Thank you. Yeah, that really kind of sums up kind of the work I've done so far. So I'm happy to hear from my colleagues or anybody else. Okay. Mr. So I just have one question about planting new trees. And does it have to be within the town right away adjacent to the house? Um, to answer your question, um, it doesn't specifically say it has to be adjacent to the house. Uh, chapter 87, um, it, it's difficult because these laws were written in, in, in the 1890s and had, there hasn't been much update since 1913 when they changed some language uh, to add vehicles <laughs> into, the, into the law. And then one other update in the 1950s to incorporate um, power lines. Um, so some of this is up to a bit of interpretation. Um, it doesn't specifically say where the tree came down, a tree has to be planted. It just says in the vicinity. So, um, you know, I just do my best to try to replace the inches um, as close as possible um, to where the tree had, had, had come down. Uh, but council is 100% right. There is a statute in chapter 87 where setback planting is, is part of um, the chapter 87 planting. You can plant within 25, 20 feet of the public right away because that tree will benefit um, the road. And the whole idea is to try to um, cast shade um, on, on the streets. Um, so that's where uh, the original uh, thought process was to protect public shade trees. So it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly where the tree came down, but in the vicinity. Thank you. And the reason I say that because I live in this area and the area where this tree is, there's a, on George Street, there are a number of trees and I think th there would be some space for another tree to be put there, but it might actually have some difficulty because of the enormous amount of shade that's already in the area where this tree is. But if you go around on Hillside, where I face this house, there's a whole, I mean, there's gotta be 75 
foot stretch of sidewalk with no trees. There's a tree on the corner, and then the, I, I assume at some point there were trees, but I would anticipate you could put a whole lot of trees on the hillside side of it, which would extend beyond this house. There would be at least a few opportunities on this property, but the property behind it, there's no street trees on that on hillside on that side of the road either. So I think you know that would certainly be in the vicinity that stretch of hillside, right next to, on, on the hillside side of the property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I agree because I'm, um, I'm I'm pretty familiar with um, with the area. Yeah. So in my opinion, uh, the corner lot hillside in George Street would be a targeted place for shade trees yep. to start with. All the way to Renfrew because I, I don't think there's any trees on that side except for that corner of Renf of Hillside and George. I don't believe there's any trees all the way down to Renfrew. And that's where I, the, that's correct. The, the adjacent property, not this particular property, but I mean, I, I think everybody would appreciate more, more trees on that side of the road. I concur. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll get the easy one out of the way first. And um, I don't know if it's our tree warden, Mr. Laquee, for our town council, Attorney Heim. It's a process question um, where the Zoning Board of Appeals, ZBA, um, also, I believe, has to make a ruling or uh, take a vote on this. Um, is that something that should happen? before this board makes a decision, and I only say that um, traditionally in the past, um, unless it's a policy statement like Mugar, since we appoint the ZBA members, um, when there's been a dual decision, usually ZBA, zoning board, I'm gonna say ZBA for That's Zoning right. Board of Appeals, ZBA um, starts the process and then it comes to the board, so there's no, um, perception of the appointing authority making a ruling and then it goes back to them um, I, and I don't know if I'm saying it, if the town manager or someone or Mr. Attorney Heim could speak to that is there a process issue should they weigh in first there's an excellent question Mr. Mahan and I'm not sure that we've I, I've seen quite this circumstance come up before so the immediately there's kind of a little bit of a question to me is what they're proposing to do as of right, or is it something that requires a special permit? So um, not to get back into the driveway discussion, but like without a very specific proposal in front of me, I'm not exactly sure, are, are we talking about something that is has to be a second driveway? Can it be done in a way that's a single driveway that's within the width limitations? There's a little bit of stuff about the width with respect to within the setback. I know what Mr. Hurd is saying, there's a little bit of a difference between a driveway that's long enough so that you're not in the setback anymore when you have parking areas, and the driveway that basically is in the side yard or setback, and there's almost nothing else there, if that makes sense. So um, the bottom line is, is that if they require a special permit, I see what your point is, Mrs. Mahan, which is that if they should require a special permit, it might be helpful for the board to know whether or not the ZBA is inclined to grant the relief they're asking before it's taking down a public shade tree based on that relief. Um, if they don't, and it's by right, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. If it's by right, you could do it either way, and they don't necessarily have to be dependent on each other. So I'm sorry that I can't be a little bit more um, direct and just say, yes, no, this is the right way to do it. But if it is by special permit, you might want to defer to the ZBA first and say, hey, why don't you guys let us know whether you think this is feasible before we authorize taking down a tree? If it's by right, they're, they're kind of parallel rather than intersecting. Which is sort of the way, I'm not gonna try to do any tree metaphors, it's sort of the way I'm leaning right now. Um, and I don't know if our tree warden, Mr. Laqueef, if um, I, I don't recall in my time here, this sort of coming before us, but um, if you have any thoughts on um, well, my first thing would be, when can we get that determined so we know if ZBA is involved? And then, um, but I don't know if Mr. Laqueef has any comments on my process question. Mr. Laqueef? It's okay if you don't. Yeah, um, 
I don't know as far as the setback parameters. What I do know with working with um, the town engineers is that um, only one driveway is permitted um, unless special approval from uh, the GBA and the curb cut. So that's the actual width at the end of the driveway as you make way onto the public right of way. So that can only be 20 feet. So you could possibly make a cut 20 feet and extend your driveway left and right to fit multiple cars. But I don't know how that affects um, the setback areas. Um, that's, as, that's as much as I know as far as um, any driveway issues and, and working with trees themselves. Okay. Another, Mr. Hurt, did you have something that you could perhaps enlighten me? I see. No, I a just had a comment. Oh. Other, I just, can we? No, it's totally fine. Sorry, I don't want to take up no, anybody's sorry. time. I feel like I keep jumping. But we can, I assume we can have a contingent approval where we say that we approve the removal of a tree on the contingency that they A, move forward with the driveway, B, if they need a permit, and C, if they do need to go to the ZBA, they need, they get approval. Well, so the only situation where they're going to, and of course, the applicants are also going to want that too because they're not going to want to pay four thousand dollars into the tree fund and then find out that they can't even put their driveway in. So, Attorney Hammond, I assume we can have some sort of a contingent approval, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Mr. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what Mrs. Mahan was getting at from a process question. To some degree, that's up to the board. I mean, as Mr. Lequeve was highlighting, Chapter Eighty Seven predates the zoning bylaw as we know it. So, there's not a specific order that things necessarily have to be done in it's just depends on whether or not you're concerned that you would be sending like a signal that you know whatever now you could say that I'm not sending a signal because I'm saying this is contingent upon your approval and we want you to evaluate it as you would evaluate anything else but there's not a specific legal hard stop that says you cannot do that yeah. and my only comment on that is that I don't think they have to go to the ZBA but if they do ZBA, there's no filing fee. You don't generally hire an attorney to come on for a tree hearing. A lot of people, for the, a zoning hearing, they have to pay $400 or whatever it is. They have to, they generally hire, they, not everyone does, but they might hire an attorney. There's more costs. There's more time involved. They might have to get a site plan at that point. So there's a lot of costs that they now have to incur before they even know if they can move forward from our perspective. So, I mean, if we can do it, continue, and I don't know if the board even is going to move forward to approve it, and that's certainly up in the air. But I think there is a situation where we can have a contingent approval pending approval of the building department for them to move forward with the driveway and make it airtight so if the driveway never gets put in, the tree never gets taken down. And again, I think the applicants would want that because they're going to, in, uh, if we do move forward, they're going to, whether they put in new trees or they pay into the tree fund, they're going to incur significant expense and it will be all for naught if they don't get approval of the ZBA. I can, yes, I agree. I, I, I agree. Okay. Thank um, you, Mr. Hurd. I, I would just say I'm just not comfortable with doing that because that's been an issue in the past that the board's been very cognizant of, that anything that goes before ZBA and also goes before the board, we don't take position on an approval until it comes before us. And the, the only reason I'm being a stickler about this, so I wouldn't be voting for it. My thing is I'd like to see everything else done first because we're setting a process up. Um, so somebody else could come in in the future, start with the board, and say, well, I want your approval contingent upon, and then I'll go to ZBA, or then I'll go to ARB. Um, and, and that's something that probably can be done within two or three weeks. And if it's determined within a week that they don't have to go before Z, Z, the ZBA, then that's fine too. But um, I'm just thinking not just this application, but future applications. We're setting the process up by which it goes. And that has been an issue in the past when I've been on the board. Because when I first got on the board, um, the then Zoning Board of Appeals, well, I won't go into old history, you're all <clears throat> maybe aware of that, but that was an issue and then the board took steps to make sure that that was really 
um, de delineated. So I would want to vote on this until if there is a Zoning Board of Appeal hearings, it has to happen, that that should be done, and that's not a cumbersome, exhaustive thing. Because even if it's a contingent vote, it's still saying we approve this, and you are appointees, what do you say? So, um, And I'm not saying they can't make a decision independent of what this board collectively or by majority thinks. Um, but I'm also thinking of the process question of when this goes forward in the future. If somebody else does the same thing and says, well, I want to start with you all because you did it last time. You know, neighbor or not neighbor kind of a thing. And then the other thing, if I could, um, Mr. Chairman, if I could just ask just sort of briefly because I, I, the letters that I have to date uh, there's like five or six of them, um, letters of objection, which I reread, so I would make sure that it was fresh in my mind. Um, if Mr. Lequeef could just kind of briefly go through the process of, um, to date I don't have any letters from neighbors um, in our packet in favor of or not in favor of this. And um, I believe there's some outreach that you do, uh, Mr. Lequeef. A, my first question would be, um, do you and what is the outreach that you do to abutting neighbors? Um, or, or have you done on this that we're supposed to do under the law? And B, am I correct that um, we, don't, we do not have any letters of objections from neighbors to date? So, yeah, so I can kind of just run, I can run through the process about um, how Chapter 87 works. So. Uh, basically, um, public shade trees protected under Massachusetts state law, Chapter 87. Um, the tree warden doesn't have the authority to remove a, a, a healthy public shade tree. So um, we have a public tree hearing. So the original hearing, um, the, the tree is posted for two consecutive weeks, um, Arlington Advocate two consecutive weeks, and in, um, on the town website. So anybody objecting could either write me um, or show up to the meeting. Um, this particular meeting was via Zoom, um, so I did receive a number of objection uh, letters um, from Arlington Tree Committee and also just from residents throughout the town. So one objection letter, so it's not a vote, it's not 10 are in favor and five disapprove. It's one objection stops the process. So anybody can object to a, um, a public shade tree being removed um, and the tree is not permitted. Be removed at that time. Uh, the requester can appeal to the select board uh, that brings us to this point um, where uh, they would like to continue the process and, and appeal the objection. So in that time, so I've um, had multiple correspondence with um, residents and with Arlington Tree Committee members um, who have written uh, to the select board, um, written me specifically um, to ask about how they can um, weigh in and discuss their uh, objection or disapproval of, of a public shade tree uh, to be removed, and specifically uh, this 18-inch honey locust. Um, so I know that the Allenton Tree Committee and other members um, of, of the town have um, reached out and um, they were hoping to participate in to tonight's um, meeting and uh, voice their um, opinion and concerns. And um, so I hope that answers um, your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. So, yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, and th thank you, Mr. Laqui, for um, answering our questions this evening and, and um, for providing us uh, some, some background here. Uh, I had a question for you, um, and I know the procedure, once an objection is raised, you don't have any further authority, and there's a uh, hearing before the select board, but uh, as a result of that, or maybe prior to that, did you have any occasion to look into the claim that the gain forts made that the tree is doing damage to their gutters, doing damage to their driveway, or um, I don't know because of the process if you didn't even reach that issue. Um, no, so that, uh, I did um, have discussions with, with, with the gain forts. That was the original re request when they first reached out to me about removing the tree. Um, they felt that um, you know it was doing um, some damage to their property, clogging gutters, clogging, um, the street. Um, this is a, um, a specific species where they have seed pods, um, and they do drop seed pods. And um, you know that's part of this this particular species of, of tree. Moving forward, uh, we're planting um, these honey locusts throughout town, but they become seedless. 
so as time evolves and trees as they design trees to be more conducive in in an urban environment and in an urban forest we're planting trees without thorn we're planting trees without seed we're planting fruitless crab apples that have pretty flowers but without the fruit so they did reach out to me and they did express their concerns but you know I said you know we all live in an urban forest you know our gutters will be clogged there'll be things that we have to rake up off the ground public works they do their best to try to clean up the streets and try to keep storm water gutters open so we did prune the tree this past May we removed the deadwood from the canopy and we did cut it back from the roof line to try to reduce kind of like the mess so to speak that this tree was 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 making and you know and not so much exactly what they told me but in their words that it was somewhat of a nuisance tree and as far as any type of underground pipes tree roots cannot enter solid objects when you buy a plant from whether it's the nursery or department store we can pick up plants roots hit the pot and they go around around in circles so when folks reach out to me that they're having sewer problems or backup problems I just let them know that you know the best thing to do is to replace those pipes those underground utility utilities are compromised and cracked but roots are very opportunistic they'll reach in places where there's cracks and crevices and they will do their best to try to grab any kind of resources that they can so like I so just to kind of button up your question we prune the tree to try to mitigate any type of mess that the tree can make and my suggestion is to repair any underground utility lines so the roots cannot enter those so this is kind of some education and some background that I give folks if anybody requesting a tree removal or just having problems with the utility pipes or their gutters or their or the facade on the house or their roof line so we combination with pruning and also with some education thank you thank you mr. Corsi and thank you mr. McQueeve so I have a few questions I mean first off when it comes to replacing in a tree of 18 inches diameter on breast height it it's not a one-for-one right I mean if you replace it with me let's say six three-inch trees me you're not going to get the same in effects on carbon sequestration that you would from an 18 entry right correct yes exactly so it's it's best to preserve the largest trees that you possibly can because the largest trees do the most they produce the most shade they sequester the most carbon not only do they do they absorb it they store it they absorb the most stormwater runoff they 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 house you know a different flora and fauna and and it produces the the most shade and it also lowers your utility bills and it also reduces light pollution and noise pollution anybody is I'm sorry and if anybody's ever pulled a top you know with leaves on it you can feel how heavy those leaves are those leaves do a an absorbent amount of grabbing rain to mitigate stormwater runoff so these are just a few examples of what larger trees do but yes larger trees do more right right so two questions that come from that and the first one is so then given that's not one for one what do you think would be like the appropriate number to replace understanding that me even if you did like a hundred trees you probably wouldn't have the same sequestration or savings or benefit that you do from the 18 incher me immediately but maybe in two or three years you would you would be there do you have a sense of what that number is that we would need in order to let's say in a couple years be where we were with that 18 inch tree was benefit providing benefits right yeah that's 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 a great question and that's really hard to like calculate and 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 try to pinpoint but you know let's let's just say 18 inches came down let's just say 12 inches were replaced so and typically in five years a tree can expand anywhere from two to five inches so but it usually takes about three years for that tree to become established 
Right. So, and, and there's also challenges about keeping that tree viable and, and to survive, especially in, in these conditions when you have you know, extreme drought. Um, right. So it's, it's hard to calculate and quantify that, right. but let's just, for, for the sake of conversation, let's say you planted 12 inch DBH, the trees are, are viable in three years, they become established. Let's say another five years after that, that's when you'll see your return. Okay. So to answer your question, 12 inches, eight years, Great, thank you. I mean, so, I mean, looking at some of the trees, in fact, I had the wrong tree in mind at first, but, but the trees under the power lines, I mean, I mean, they are, they're cut, they're pruned in a way that I think kind of removes a significant amount of their canopy. You know, I mean, like the one on Hillside, I mean, I would say probably like at least a third of the canopy is gone. That's being generous, you know. So, so then it isn't the, the width of the, the tree, the, the DBH, it's really the canopy that we're looking at in terms of carbon sequestration, right? I mean, so if a significant amount of the crown is gone, we're not getting the savings that we think we would just by looking at the, the width of the tree, the, the circumference of the tree, right? Right, yeah, exactly. You need to take in totality of the crown, uh, but the crown will se se sequester that carbon and store it in that stem tissue. That, that's where that's stored. So okay. when you see that, 18 inch tree with maybe um, a third of the canopy that had already been reduced, whether it was a storm, whether it's um, a circuit pruning from the um, utility company. Um, so those leaves are, are bringing in the carbon and are storing it inside of that stem and that wood tissue. So they do work in concert, um, but again, it's kind of hard to, to quantify well, this much is reduced, so it may not be doing all that, it, which it, it's not. It's, you know, if it had a full canopy, it would be doing 100% of that. So um, you do have to take in some notion that some of the canopy is reduced, um, but the main stem wood is actually sequestering that, that, that carbon. I got you. Okay. So then why is it that um, I mean, Arlington I mean, is... is, is um has received the consecutive growth award as, I guess, Tree City USA, the Tree City USA community. I mean, what are we doing? Yes. Yeah. What are we doing? Uh, we're, we're doing a lot. So um, one thing is that the, the town hired a full-time tree warden. Um, so that's uh, points to um, add on to our, our, our Tree City USA. Um, the the Auntie Tree Committee is, is very robust and they're doing a tremendous amount of things. Um, where they're designing an adopt a tree program where we don't have the capability in, in, in DPW to water all these trees. They're coming up with, with, with programs where folks can adopt that tree and water that tree and, and take it on as, 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 as their own. Um, also, the Olympic Tree Committee, they're um, designing a, um, a, a, a canopy planting program where we're using some of these funds where we receive from the Trees Please Fund and having folks um, uh, plant trees um, on, on their properties with, 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 some, with some beneficial funding from the trees, please. Um, we're also um, treating our emerald ash borer. Uh, we have about 950 ash trees in town that make up 10% of our canopy. And we have um, an, an invasive insect in town that's called the emerald ash borer. So we're injecting these trees to try to keep them alive. So these are just some of the many things that we're doing in town to not only keep up our Tree City USA credentials, but we're also um, received four years in a row a growth award. Um, Arlington is a leader um, um, in their surrounding communities about tree preservation and um, not only just preserving for the, for the future, but also um, planting for the future as well. And planting a dynamic um, urban forest, uh, planting um, trees in the proper location. We're getting away from planting trees underneath overhead utility lines where that um, hard pruning um, practices will, will be eliminated, as, as you had mentioned earlier. Um, so we're planting uh, proper tree species um, in the right place, and we're planting over 300 trees per year. And um, these are just some of the many things that we're doing here in town. Great, great, great. I think um, urban forest is like my favorite new oxymoron, you know, as, <laughs> certainly as a, as a city person. So, uh, uh, but, um, but in, in short though, are we adding more trees than we're losing? 
as a town? That's our goal. So we're removing about 200 trees in the public right away. These are large shade trees, uh, the Noe maples that were that's uh, growing across the street from Mr. Hurd's property. Um, the town was planted with thousands of Noe maples um, after the World War II era. They thought it was the replacement for the American Elm, but uh, we found out that they're invasive and um, over time, um, they become compromised and they and they have a limited lifespan and um, and they're falling apart. So we're removing 200 trees a year and we're planting 300 trees a year. So the idea is that we can get back to our our, our goal in 1980, uh, where we had a full complete canopy um, in Arlington, but we've been losing our, our, our tree comp our tree canopy over the years. So we're trying to. So we're removing 200 and we're planting 300. So we're trying to get a net gain of 100 trees per year. However, in, with, with climate change and, um, and, 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 and more and more heat, and we're, we're finding it difficult to keep um, these young trees alive. So we've lost probably about 60 to 65 saplings um, this season due to the drought. So we're, we're struggling to get where, what we need to go. Uh, we were looking pretty good there for a little bit, but after microbursts, storms, um, dr uh, drought, heat stress, invasive insects, uh, our goal is to hit a, an additional 2,000 trees planted in, in 20 years. We've been at it for about four years. So we had a goal of uh, 20 years to get back um, an additional 2,000 trees, um, to get back to our 1980 level, um, but um, it's, it's, it's a struggle. Okay, gotcha. And one of the things that the concerns, because I'm thinking ahead to me about other things that are coming our way, and that is, I mean, how do we measure the public good versus public good? And, um, and so at what point I mean, do we take down the healthy, huge trees I mean, and then say it's okay to replace them with smaller trees that may not even come close to replacing I mean, the benefits that we're getting from those taller trees simply because we say it's public good it's a public good, I mean, so that, because I mean, right now it's kind of easy to say, well, we're not going to take down a big tree I mean, and replace it with something smaller, you know, because, well, it's I mean, public good versus private convenience. But when it comes to public good versus public good, I, mean, I think if the overall goal is to benefit the climate, I just have a hard time getting there. But that's not for this discussion now. I'm just kind of telling you where my head is, I mean, and where I'm kind of going, I mean, um, going in general with this. You know, and, and so, um, so yeah, um, I had you know, some other questions, but I'm going to stop now, you know, and, and I think we're going to bring in you know, um, the game force, you know, uh, and then we will turn this over to anyone you know, in the um, public that wants to um, talk in the hearing. Okay, and so um, can we bring in the game force? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hello. How you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I'm on a video doing laundry for the kids. I apologize. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you all for taking your time. I'm sorry this is taking so much of it. Um, and uh, to, I just wanted to start off all saying the thank you to Tim for all the work he's done up to now. He's been really fantastic about getting back to me, and uh, it's very appreciated. Uh, so if I may, um, just to start really quickly, I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, regarding the letters in our neighborhood, we're not really inclined to ask our neighbors to write letters. It's They're all dealing with a lot of stuff as we are. So um, we haven't respectively asked them to do so. We had had one neighbor down on George who called, but um, you know, I appreciate it, but uh, you know, calls can sometimes go into the ether. Um, regarding the drains and the pipes to a, a previous comment, um, we did have some drainage issues, but as I mentioned in my last meeting uh, back in August, that I had rerouted all of the gutters and leaders to dissipate some of the water off uh, put into the drain, and that helped tremendously. We haven't had a flood since, knock wood. Um, so I'm not so much concerned about the root problems, and I, as, as Tim mentioned, um, if there are cracks, nature finds a way, it gets in, it does what it does. It is what it is. Um, however, um, it has been a major problem in the past, but it's just one more kind of thing. The tree is wonderful. We do love it. We're 
we like as in my letter and in our last meeting i mentioned that um we had planted six trees to replace our uh adjacent neighbor on uh renfrew and hillside removal of uh 12 trees we are tree people we are both lead accredited uh, professionals uh, my wife is an architect i'm a contractor we only work in sustainable you know items so we're not anti-trees it's just that we are expanding i just started the company uh, our, our daughter is about to be driving in a couple of years so we're just concerned about just being able to accommodate our lifestyle because i plan on being here for the rest of my life i love this town i coach in this town um so we are just concerned about our limitations so then to get to the next points i'm sorry if i'm rambling uh regarding the power lines um one uh council person mentioned um that the canopy has been adjusted based on those power lines um it has been a problem we have had uh, fence taken out because of a huge limb that fell on the corner of Georgia Hillside uh, during one heavy storm. Um, and it's understandable. It's part of what we are. As, as Tim mentioned, we are in an urban forest. Uh, we get that. But we are willing to do whatever the town wants to do. If you want to plant 20 trees on the walkway, we are all for it. We would love a canopy. As, as a council person, um, Mr. Hurd mentioned, it is lacking, especially now that those trees have been removed on the private property adjacent to us, and that's their complete right to do so. But it is lacking heavily on that corner right across from Mr. Hurd. Uh, and it's not just because, you know, he's a council person. It's just a fact If you're talking about carbon emission and carbon absorption. We need trees along Hillside, and we are happy to have whatever you deem proper it would be a wonder to have that. And that's what we're for. We're not, again, trying to take a tree down. So sorry to ramble. Um, and regarding the, uh, the 1980 level that Tim mentioned, having extra trees on Hillside, specifically on Hillside, would definitely get you back to those levels. So, I mean, if you take this one tree out, we are willing to do whatever is proper to, uh, uh, you know, to appropriately accommodate what is needed. So again, I'm sorry again to ramble. I appreciate all of your time and that's it. I'm sorry. If you have questions, please feel free. That's fine. You know, oh. so it, it, we, I'm we sorry. Just... I'm sorry. If I may, just one more time. Um, we would prefer to do a long, as I mentioned, it seems that we would like to do the tree line in the public way to uh, accommodate for the 18 inch diameter. Um, and we are happy whatever we can do appropriately, whatever you know, Tim would think is the appropriate amount of distance and then we would definitely pay into to, to make the you know the appropriate uh, contribution that would make up for that and we were happy to plant even more trees on our property we plan plan two more uh to, to speak of so uh we are tree people so sorry that's it right. thank you i did leave one this part open-ended you know and i had said that i was going to go right into the the hearing part of this but i'll just stop and ask my colleagues if you have any questions for the game for? Okay. Nope. Okay. So, yes. If I could, um, I just want to make, clarify that I understand sort of what the potential cost would be, and, and, and just verify with our, you know, with, with Mr. Hainforth that that's the ballpark that we're talking about. Um, if I'm calculating this correctly, if uh, if the homeowner decided um, to just pay into the Trees Please Fund, that's nearly seven thousand dollars. Um, from what, for the 18 inches, um, according to what Mr. Cleave um, said, so that's that's not insubstantial. Um, and you know, I know that it, if the homeowner decided to, to work with the town to plant the trees, that the cost could still approach that just because of what trees cost. Um, so I just kind of want to put that out there um, and make sure that the resident understood that. And um, uh, before we get a whole lot further, and, and also invite correction if I'm doing the math wrong, or not understanding what's going on. <laughs> If I may, um, we would love the trees. We want the trees. We would prefer to have this tree removed, but have more trees on our on, on our walkway. I think it would be wonderful for the, for the neighbors, for the canopy, for the carbon absorption. Um, and I know that our neighbors would love it. And again, I'm sorry we don't have letters to, to, to help 
in our efforts, we are not imposing on our neighbors to ask them to write letters. We're just hoping that you know the town's announcement on the tree that Tim and his crew put up was enough. Um, so again, sorry, please forgive me. Yes, yeah, so we want more trees. We would love more trees, and we are happy to pay for them. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're going to move into the public hearing part of this. I mean, and so uh, I'm going to ask. Uh, each speaker to limit themselves to three minutes and 10 seconds. And you've got, I thought maybe we were gonna have a countdown clock inside the um, window here, and I, I don't see one. I mean, so I have to work with ACMI to, to get that so that the speakers could more easily see it in another time. I mean, but we see it here. I mean, and so I'll, um, I'll let you know when you have about 30 seconds left. I mean, so, uh, so we'll bring in uh, Steve Moore first. Hello, Steve, and, uh, and talking is permitted at this point. So um, you're going to have three minutes and 10 seconds, um, Mr. Puller. I was just waiting for him to get in. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It took a while to push all the right buttons here. To um, yeah, uh, I'm Steve Moore. I live on Piedmont Street, and I'm a member of the Arlington Tree Committee. Um, I was part of the, the initial hearing uh, back in August. Uh, when, when the initial appeal was presented, and um, I, I was quite frustrated at the time and that I couldn't provide any input. There was no possibility for the board to get any input other than uh, what was provided by the appellant, which uh, surprised me since this was a, an appeal of a tree hearing where a number of objections had been raised. I was one of the original objectors back in, uh, in April, um, that original hearing. Um, and so all this to say that I'm very pleased with the way this is going tonight. This is exactly how I had envisioned it, it should happen. And I'd like to encourage for tree hearings uh, that make it to the select board in the future, appeals of, of tree hearings, I mean, um, that this process happens this way because there's clearly a lot of public interest in this. Uh, I'm biased, I have particular interest in this. Uh, and uh, and I, I, it sounds like the board uh, is also registering some very good points of interest on not much of a growing issue. I mean, from my perspective, the tree warden and uh, the Arlington Tree Committee are basically your resource professional and appointees for tree information. And I would hope that you would always turn to both Mr. Leave and, and our committee for information uh, when issues like this come up, because we have a lot of, uh, some of it's just experience, some of it's expertise, but uh, again, we, we should serve as a resource to you. And I would like to suggest in the future process for these sorts of things, you don't ever move forward uh, without uh, asking for the opinion of the tree warden on issues and also the tree committee for input as in their roles as advisors to the select board. I think that probably is a good way to go just in terms of best practice in the future, even though uh, Mr. Heim has clearly pointed out that there's no language that requires that as part of the Chapter 87 uh, tree hearing appeal process. I think the board should just adopt that as a practice because I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, so, I'm not going to say much more about tree issues in particular because there are a lot of people who want to speak with good knowledge on this. I just uh, want to say that I think this is a very bad precedent to set. Uh, say again, I'm sorry? 30 seconds. Oh, 30 seconds. It's, it's a very bad precedent. Inconvenience is not a valid reason to take a public shade tree. 18 inch shade tree uh, cannot be replaced, as you've heard, by small replacement trees. This tree has survived and established itself. And as Mr. Lee pointed out, that's not happening with our current batch of planted trees. So I think we should keep this tree and not uh, not take okay. enough. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. So next we'll have Keith Snelby Snebly. Well, Keith, can you hear us? It's not in yet. Okay. 
like um steve can you guys hear me can you see me uh we can't see you we can hear you okay it says that my camera is on how's that that's better sitting on my front porch enjoying the evening in this this select board meeting uh, my name is Keith Schnebley. I live on Webb Cowett Road. Um, I am a member of the tree committee. Um, however, I'm just speaking as a private citizen of Arlington um, in this hearing. Um, it, I sort of just want to tell a story about how I got involved in the tree committee. About five years ago, a developer wanted to take down a very healthy ash in order to build a driveway. And um, the neighbors could rally, actually came to the select board in a, in a similar um, hearing um, and spoke very passionately about why we needed to keep this tree. Um, and I remember in that hearing, one of the select board who's no longer on the board asked, what's so special about this tree? And I wanted to address that point because I feel like it's probably the same point for this tree that's up here. We have lost a tremendous amount of canopy in this town since I've lived here, and I've lived here 30 years. On this road, when I moved in, there was a dozen beautiful maple trees that tree line, it was gorgeous in the autumn, we had shade up and down. Um, we don't have that anymore. We have two healthy trees, one isn't a locust, and I understand every now and then it drops a tremendous number of seed pods, and the other is the ash. So we've been very threatened, we've had a lot of trees come down during that time, and we witnessed you know, the canopy falling apart. Um, we have maybe three unhealthy trees left, two healthy trees, but working with Tim and the town, we've actually planted close to a dozen trees on this street. And it has been, I would say, longer, it's been about four years for those. There were some trees that were planted earlier. It, even the 15-year-old trees here are nowhere close to what that locust is. It takes several decades to reach that point. Um, and so, what we've come down to as a tree committee and what tree, uh, Tim is trying to do and the town is trying to do is preserve our canopy, especially the healthy trees, um, take down the ones that are unhealthy and plant as much as we can to replace that canopy, but it takes a long time. So we need to do the planting and I would suggest we plant along hillside regardless of whether this tree comes down or not. Um, and, you know, it preserve our canopy for as long as we can while we're building a new um, canopy. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So next we have Susan Stamps. Okay. All right. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, also, uh, hang, my name is Susan Stamps. Hang on a second before you start, me. Can you maybe, Susan, me, your your video is 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 perpendicular. It's know? okay. Yeah. Let me try it like there this. We there we go. Is that right. better? Yeah, it's better. You know, so okay, thank you. just want to <laughs> look as good as possible. You know, um, so thank all right, you. go ahead. Um, Susan Stamps, Grafton Street, uh, town meeting member, been on the tree committee for several years. The what's concerning to me about the select boards even considering negotiating with the homeowner about removal of a public tree is that with all respect, it, it seems like the board is is not really treating public trees like the public assets that they are. Public trees, street trees are owned by the citizens of the town. And as far as I know, the town does not allow private homeowners to encroach upon public assets for their own private convenience. For example, um, if I wanted to um, claim a corner of the park near my house for just my, my children's playground, just this corner of the park, of course, Park and Rec wouldn't let me do it because it's an asset for use by the entire town. Um, and I, there are lots of examples like that. We, I mean, it, um, if, if, the, if the question were, there's a public project like Broadway Plaza 
Um, the plan is to take down some trees. We may not like it, but at least you're weighing the public interest of a nice refurbished plaza to the public interest of a tree. Um, but in this situation, for the first time in my memory, um, since I've been on the tree committee, um, the board is listening, is, is hearing the request of a private homeowner to take down a public tree. The only other one I can remember was the web power tree that uh, Mr. Schnebley um, uh, referred to a few minutes ago. The, I, I think that private homeowners don't come in and ask to have the tree, a public tree taken down, is that they know that it's going to be rejected. The, the tree ward by law has to reject it. Um, the, um, and by the way, there's nothing in the state law chapter 87 that I've seen that allows negotiating with the private homeowner replacing trees um, for the loss of a public tree. Uh, if, if you can find that, I'd be interested to see that. But there is, there's no standard for the appeal. And um, basically, am I running out? 30 seconds. Okay, thank you. Um, the, if, if the select board uh, allowed this removal, it will open the floodgates to other private homeowners coming in, asking for the private tree near their property to be removed. Um, the builders who've worked so in such good faith with the tree warden to save trees on their projects for the good of the town will say, well, well gee, well, what, what happened to us? Okay, Susan, why, thank why, you. Why expect thank you very much, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, we'll have Don Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I'm a resident of Arlington for 50 years. Uh, I'm not going to talk about trees. I'm going to talk about driveways. And to answer a question that was asked at the beginning of this meeting, um, the Bible 6.1.10 specifies that the maximum width of the driveway, not just the curb cut, is 20 feet. Um, it also specifies that a driveway really can't terminate in a front yard. It has to lead to a legal parking space, either in a garage or um, past the foundation line in the side or rear yard. And for those reasons, what the applicant is proposing just is not feasible. Um, you can't make a, a wider single driveway that will satisfy the bylaw for engineering reasons. It's a very steep driveway, and unless they're planning on uh, digging under the house and creating a two-car garage under grade, it can't be done. So the only alternative is to put the, um, a second driveway in in the side leading to the side yard. And that automatically triggers a zoning board of appeals um, process. And they're very unlikely to grant approval for this second driveway because it will create a dangerous and unsightly situation of three driveways side by side by side. Fortunately, there's a very um, good alternative for these homeowners. And that is the Zoning Board of Appeals would almost certainly approve a second driveway that leads from Hillside into their very large uh, side rear yard um, on, the, on the other side of the street. So um, this is putting the cart before the horse. Uh, this board shouldn't even be considering um, whether to move the tree until the ZBA rules on where a second driveway could be. Um, established. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. So uh, next we have Mara Vatt. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I would just like to thank the select board for taking this much time to hear this case. I did write a letter of objection and um, I hope you've all read that and I would just like to address a few more points. I hear that the applicants want more trees, uh, but it's not clear if this property has enough room for the replacement trees, although I did hear a select board member request that the replacement trees be allowed to be planted further down the block, specifically in front of his house. 
The resident side of Hillside Avenue, however, has power lines, which limits the choices of trees that we could plant. As Tim said, it would take half a dozen trees plus eight years to equal the benefits of this single mature tree. The applicants have expressed how badly they want trees on Hillside. I would like to remind you that you do not need to remove the 18 inch tree in order to plant more trees. You can request trees in the fall planting and the spring planting to be planted on Hillside. It sounds like they really need trees there. The town does not currently have the resources to water all the trees that get planted every fall and spring. If the replacement trees, in this case, don't survive for the first three years, will the town be responsible for replacing them a second time? Will the town be responsible for watering and for caring them, caring for them? Um, if you've driven around Arlington at all this summer, you will see that many of the new trees that have gone in the ground are not surviving. So it's not at all clear that replacement trees would actually replace the benefits of this tree. It might take decades before you get enough trees established in that location to replace the benefits of this tree. Last, I would like you to think about the precedent that you're setting. You're allowing residents to destroy public assets in order to develop their private property. What will you say when a builder makes the same request if you approve this removal, how on earth will you protect trees in front of new construction? Thank you. Thank you, Mara. So looks like that's it. And, and so the public hearing part of this item is over. And we just lost my connection. Oh, it's actually right back. And so I'll turn back to my colleagues. Oh, Mr. Hurd. I'll just clarify, I'm not asking for any trees to be planted in front of my house. The strip that I'm talking about, which Mr. Queef is aware of is diagonally and across the street from me. All right. Um, I mean, I don't know if the, I hate to keep kicking this down the road, but if the first decision is going to be whether or not it needs ZBA approval, then I'm certainly happy to, I, I want to make sure everyone's comfortable and voting on the merits of the request. So I think, if anything, I think we can get a pretty quick answer from the building department as to whether or not it needs to go to the ZBA. So I guess I would be moving to, a pr to table once again the hearing in order to get a clear indication from, so I don't think it would be, I don't think we need to send it to the ZBA for this. I think we need to send it to the building department to confirm or to, whether or not this uh, a driveway in the proposed location would need ZBA approval. And if it does, I think it would be prudent for the board to come back and, and continue the hearing until after the ZBA approval. I wouldn't want to continue it. No, I'll retract back. <laughs> I'm going to rest on what I just said. Second that. Okay. Um, the only other option would be postpone to the 28th, which I would be happy to do, but I don't know if that gives everybody enough time. So definitely move to table, but if we can get all of our T's crossed, I dotted, and it can get back on the 28th, I'll leave that to the chairman. Um, so I'll yeah. second your motion, Mr. Hart. Yeah, so I would just follow that. I'd move, put it in the chair's discretion and speak with the town manager to get it. Once we have a determination, then we're ready to hear the merits of the, the request. So if it's the 28th, great. If it's in October, then we just don't want to come back, go through the whole process again, and not have an answer on that yet. All right. It's on. So I just be clear, the, the board is proposing to continue the hearing until after the determination is made by the, the uh, zoning enforcement officer, who is the director of inspectional services, as to whether or not this is as of right or a special permit or any project. The one thing that the, the building inspector will need just for the applicant's uh, knowledge is they'll need at he'll need at least a sketch plan of what's exactly going to happen. So it's got to be specific enough to know this is the relief, th this, this is the parameters of this, so I would know whether you need that. I think that's fairly normal for the building inspector, but, but for the applicant's information, they'll need to be specific enough to answer some of the questions about is it going to be a different grade, is it going to be the same grade, Whereas 
going to extend to, how wide, stuff like that. Yep. Understood. I guess my question is, I mean, can we make the motion such that it doesn't have to come back to us if it's determined that it needs to go to the ZBA? I think we would have to dispose of the hearing either way. So it would have to come back to us to, I don't, there's no ramifications if we deny an application, correct? As I, I know with Mr. zoning. Mr. Correct, there's no two uh, year. denial yeah. and the prejudice has some sort of two year uh, moratorium on bringing back, you know, I mean, there's some notice requirements and things like that that need to happen. If you deny it, they would have to start back with the tree warden. And if I may just clarify something, this is an appeal of the tree warden's decision. That is authorized by the law. The select board is not deciding that it wants to hear an appeal. The applicants have a right, once they've been denied at the initial tree hearing, to present an appeal for the select board. The select board has the authority to say, no, forget it, I don't want to do it, or say yes, or whatever. But it's in Chapter 87 that an appeal goes to the select board in a town. So, uh, yes, there's no like prejudicial effect of a denial. Oh, right. Sorry. Right. Mm -hmm. There's no there's no prejudicial effect of a denial going back. There'd be no prejudicial effect of a withdrawal either. The only thing is that you'd have to start back with the original notice requirements and the tree warden hearing. Unless Mr. Lequeve has any corrections to that, I believe that that's really the procedural thing. So, if you want to continue, um, I think Mr. Hurd is correct that you would eventually have to dispose of this appeal. <laughs> Well, I think we also would have to wait on the merits at that time, whether it goes to the issue that we, we had talked about before, whether we wanted to give a contingent approval versus um, just outright waiting till after the ZBA, because that is a whole different ball of wax. But I think the first determination that this board needs at least, is at least to know if it needs to go to the ZBA, and that should be a fairly easy determination to make. All right, so we have that motion and a second by Ms. Mahan. You know, you know, I'm going to have this one, but I want to turn to my colleagues first. Any comments, questions? No questions. All right, well, um, I think while we have people here, and um, now, uh, uh, so, Mr. Heim, I mean, regarding Article 16, I mean, it says something I mean, to the extent, effect of that I mean, nothing in this article should apply to public shade trees. I mean, I feel as if I'm just missing something. I mean, like, I, I feel as if I'm missing something obvious. I mean, so, so does Article 16 have any application of what we're dealing with here? Are you talking about, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, are you talking about town bylaw? Yeah, town bylaw, yeah. yeah. That's a regulation, regulation on the use of private property. This is public property. Okay, all right. The tree belt is within the layout of the public way. All right. Um, so a lot of people think of like that little grass strip as part of their property, but it's actually not. It's, it's part of the street, technically speaking. And so public shade trees, unless they're setback trees, are all planted within what's essentially public property. All right. So chapter 87 governs public, public shade trees. Our regulations on the use of private property really govern trees that are not on public Land. Yeah, okay, that's what I'm saying. Right, right. there, there's some tweaks and things like that to it, but the bottom line is, is that it's oriented mostly towards that, and it's also mostly oriented towards being triggered by things like construction. Okay, all right. You know, well, I'll tell you how I, mean, I got to this point, I mean, um, I mean in easy agreement, I mean, to uh, even considering this, because I, I got to say, when I came in, when I saw this item on, I was like, well, of course, I mean, we're going to support the tree warden I mean, um, and the tree committee I mean, and, and, and not reverse the, the decision to take down, the, to, to keep the tree. And, uh, and, and then, you know, we look, we, it, seemed, it seemed like the process that happened with the hearing and, um, was just perfunctory. And, um, what we got uh, was pretty much the tree warden saying, well, we had an objection. I mean, and so we're going to leave the tree up, which just seemed to me to not give any kind of rationale I mean, for, for leaving the tree up. I mean, and so, so because it seemed like it was not really um, deliberated on um, in any meaningful way, I mean, I felt, well, it came to us for deliberation, and that's what we were doing. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, my feelings are, first off, I mean, um, 
the, the tree warden's opinion I mean, has a very large weight for me, you know, and the tree committee um, opinion has a very large weight for me also. Uh, I feel that if we're going to do anything different, it has to be done, you know, in, uh, we have to build a framework, you know, uh, that we can then apply you know, consistently, you know, and that would take some time, you know, and it would take some time. And I think it would take I mean, a fair amount of public input. It, I would be up for it because I, I do feel that the, we, um, I feel that we can come up with a system I mean, that would accommodate these kinds of requests I mean, and then put us in a better state I mean, in a relatively short amount of time. I mean, and I think we could come up with that framework that would also allow us to deal with public good versus public good I mean, and what number of trees we need to um, put up to really effectively replace what we're taking down. Because for me, I mean, the paramount issue I mean, is the amount of carbon sequestration and other benefits I mean to the environment. I mean, if that's paramount, then we just need to do the math I mean, and then figure out how we get the number of trees I mean, that, that we need. And so I would like I mean, for the tree warden and the tree committee I mean, and the town I mean, to really work on this, this uh, before I would just say, go against what the tree warden is recommending and what the tree committee is recommending. Now, if either or both of those want to change the recommendation I mean, um, in this situation, then once again, I mean, I'll go along with that, but I'm just gonna have a hard time you know, not supporting ultimately I me mean, where they are lining up since it's their job I mean, to really know this stuff I mean, a whole lot better than at least I do, you know, um, and so, uh, so that's where I'm, that's where I am. I mean, with respect to this motion, I mean, I see what its objective is, and I'm fine with going along with it. But I'm just kind of giving you a sense of where I'm headed in in, in the long run on this. Uh, so, so, um, so that's it. So, unless someone else wants to say something, we're, yeah, Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, uh, th 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 thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and I appreciate your comments. You know, big reason why we have the situation, and, and Ms. Stamps mentioned there's no provision for negotiation in Chapter 87. There's no standards in Chapter 87. So let's get that on the table. And that's one of the things that makes it difficult for us in an appeal process. And the appeal is properly before us. There are no standards. DCR publishes a document, a, a guide to local tree ordinances, and they recognize in that guide that there are situations under Chapter 87 where there are no standards and it makes it difficult for municipalities. So that's where we are, okay? And, and I, I think there's some, there's some strong arguments here. We have, we have a tree on George Street that if we were planting a tree, we would not plant a honey locust that has seeds. They're seedless that is planted. And on the, on the other side, we don't want to be cutting down trees because it, it is a detriment to the public. So we have a conflict here, and we're trying to work through it. There is a proposed, there is some guidance that DCAR provides, and, and one of the things that I was trying to think through, and Mr. Laqueve was talking about what would you need to replace, and in one of the proposed um, guidelines or regs that municipalities could think of, of, of using is, uh, I'm going to read it. Petitions for the removal and tree replacement must demonstrate that the removal and replacement of a tree will be of greater benefit to the inhabitants of the town than the existing tree. Now, that's on the petitioners. That's the petitioner's burden. Maybe that's the type of thing we can think about when we come back uh, later in the month. But, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's been a good discussion tonight, but I think the reason why we're, we've had two meetings here and we're hearing from people is, we don't have any standards that the statute has provided for us. You're right, Mr. D Mr. Chairman. Article 16 does not apply to us um, because it's only private property. So here we are. I think the petitioner deserves their hearing. I think before we make a decision, we get as much information as we can. And is it, if there is a way to show a benefit, um, you know, maybe we think about it. I don't know where I'm going to come out on it yet, but I, I, I think there's a lot to consider here. And, and Again, repeating myself for the third time, a lack, lack of standards is, is really what, what uh, creates a difficulty. I will say one thing on a lighter note. I, I want to give credit to Mr. Seltzer for a clever virtual background because that was the tree in question that was behind him when, uh, before us when, when he spoke tonight. So um, those, those are a few thoughts that I had. All right. well, well, thank you very much. Okay. So, yes, Mr. Hurd. And I meant to mention this before. 
and I think we're going to have another opportunity to speak, but just to one of the comments, we have had, at least since I've been, I wasn't on the board when the Web Cowit tree hearing happened, but I, I know I've been a part of a few since. So it isn't a situation where this is the first private homeowner to, I remember one of my first uh, articles, I think when I was on the board, we took, we allowed to the removal of a tree over the objection of the tree warden who was here at the time, back then, and uh, it was because the private homeowner had a son who was fearful of the tree and thought it was going to come through his window, which um, is certainly a valid concern, but it has happened. This is not a novel situation that has never come before this board. It sounded like that was where some of the speakers had come, were coming from an angle that this has never happened before. It has. And it is, like Mr. Corsi just said, there is a process for it. There is a process. We all, I don't think there's anybody that is in disagreement over whether this is a healthy, mature tree. And that's the role of the tree warden. And to some extent that the tree committee, and we're, we've established that it's a healthy, mature tree. I think that's, again, the tree warden's role in this process is to tell us that. But there is a process where the board is vested with this authority, and you look at the totality of the circumstances. So we'll talk about this again, but um, so I just want to clarify those couple of points. Thank you very much. So on a motion by Mr. Hurd, that we send this to the building inspector in order to determine whether or not this needs to go to the ZBA and a second by Mrs. Mahan. Uh, Mr. Heim? Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. It's an unanimous vote. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's a good hearing. You know, learned a lot. And uh, a lot more to um, go. And, uh, so, all right. Moving on, you know, we are on item number 10, review, approval, review and approval of the 2022-2023 Select Board and Town Manager Goals. And, and so I uh, hope we've gotten them, had a couple of three weeks to, to look at them, and uh, uh, essentially if there's anything that folks need, feels was, was missed out, was left out, you know, or needs to be altered in some way, you know, now's the time. Approval. And approval, motion for approval by Mr. Hurd. Second. <laughs> Second by Mr. Helmuth. <laughs> also. And, and um, any other comments? And I'll just add for the public cons uh, consumption, uh, although this is a comprehensive set of goals, uh, it's not an exhaustive set of goals, meaning so you may see I mean, some other things happen I mean, um, um, from expired by this board, the members of the board, you know, and that's okay. That's that'd be a good thing. And so yes, Mrs. Mahan. And just very briefly, I wanna um sincerely thank the chair and the town manager um for A conducting the goals meeting, which is no easy feat, and gathering all the information from before, which we had a couple of blips in there and um Mr. Pooler, our town manager, um got all the information and the chair may, you know, help expedite that as well as coming up with the goals that are before us. Um, we don't do them just to do them. Number one, you know, they're a framework and a guide and they don't just happen. Uh, someone who's been involved in things like that, I know that. So I wanna thank the chair and, and, and the town manager and, um, and the ancillary staff that, um, if that's the correct word to use, um, that help bring this all together. Cause it's a lot of work. Uh, it looks like it's an easy thing and you know, it's a, 12, 14 page document of the two combined goals, and but um, th there's a lot of work behind that, so I do appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Manager. Yeah, you're welcome. You know, so um, I remember now, you know, I'm just kind of thrown off a little bit because Mr. Heim has, has left, so I guess I will be the one to conduct the, the, the roll call. So, on a motion by Mr. Hearn. And a second by Mr. Helmuth be that we approve our goals. You know, now I need to remember the order in which we do this. 
Okay. Whatever order you choose. Order you're the chair. Uh, whatever order I want. Okay, well, I want to remember the order that Doug does it. Me. So, uh, Mr. Helmuth? Yes. And Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. And Mr. Hurd? Yes. And Mrs. Mahan? Yes. And yes. You know, so I think I got that right. Maybe Reverse one. Huh? Huh? <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Um, I think I got it right. Anyways, I mean, I could do it however I want, so I'll take it. Sure. You know, so um, so future select board here meetings, you know, and hearings too. I'm sure. Yeah. So uh, looking at the calendar, I mean, I'm not gonna look at it because I've thought about it a fair amount. You know, and what I am thinking is is that we do a meeting on the 17th. I know it'll be. A while from the meeting on the 28th. I mean, that meeting is a Wednesday, and uh, and then maybe have a tentative meeting being on the 24th. Meaning that if the agenda for the 17th is just so packed, I mean, uh, that it's really clear I mean, that we can't get it all done. I mean, at least we're prepared I mean, to have a meeting on the 24th. I mean, the only reason I hesitate I mean, on saying the the um, the 31st I mean, is because it's Halloween, you know, and, and I mean, <laughs> folks, we I definitely can't go <laughs> on Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> are, you being, are you serious? Meet, meet on Halloween. Huh? I said I definitely can't meet on Halloween. You're, you're serious, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm just making sure. <laughs> I, wasn't sure I wasn't sure if you were just being facetious in which case, because that's fine. No, not here. I mean, and, we, and we may have people that we like to show up at the meeting who, uh, who really wouldn't be in a position to um, either, so that's why I'm being a little um, deferential, I mean, to uh, Halloween. Although, I mean, I, I'll tell you, Mr. Dunn has come in in some pretty impressive costumes, you know, on the at least Halloween um, meeting, if not on Halloween day, at least the meeting closest to Halloween. Uh, and so, so. You just gave me an easy one, but I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the chambers are cursed on Halloween, so okay, that could so be a problem. No. What, what were you saying for the dates? Only because I honestly have worked in the select board's office back when it was the board of selectmen. Um, what are you saying for dates? Because I know for October we'll definitely have enough for two decent-sized meetings, as well as procedurally with um, just regular administrative things. So can you say the dates to me again? So, so the 17th, yeah, for sure, yeah, which, and then the 24th is a tentative. Because the, the, the 10th is a holiday, and then I think the 3rd is a little bit too close to our meeting on the 28th. How about the 12th and the 24th? Ooh. Um, oh, I, okay. Oh, yeah. so Monday. Is there another night that we all can meet that we yeah. isn't an automatic no? Such as a Wednesday, perhaps? Or? That's, what, that's what the 12th yeah. is. What yeah, about the 13th? The 12th, is, yeah. and, and the 12th is, is, is a TAC meeting. What about know? 13th? The 13th Thursday? Yeah, I can do a, thir a Thursday, you know? Well, I have hockey practice every day until April 15th, but they generally allow me to get out early enough to, okay. to go to any day of the week is fine. Can <laughs> I propose 13th? He can't do 12th. You can't do 12th? It's tack. I mean, I really want to. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, Mr. Town Manager, does the 13th prevent, present any difficulties for potential staffing, or it's just I just raised the issue because it's not it's not a regular meeting night. Like, we don't usually do a, a Thursday. Yeah, I, I have to ask. Um, I mean, we're open till seven, so a lot of staff will be around anyway. Yeah. Um, so I'm not aware, and I'm looking. On my own calendar, that there's anything particular that would be a problem that day. Council confer agrees. So, so then we're thinking the 13th and then the 24th. 24th. Is that okay? Yeah. I'm just thinking of the yeah. business of the select board's yeah. office, yeah. especially in October. They need those for people coming in. I know it sounds silly, yeah. but if someone says, if we say you got to wait three and a half weeks, it's like, yeah. oh. I gotta pay another month, you know. No, I, think, uh, I think it's really reasonable. Uh, but, but then, I'm not being disrespectful. No, no, I hear you, but 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 it is just yeah. two business days before the 17th. I'm saying 13 and 24. Right, right, and and yeah, and I, I was supposed to 17 and 24, but yeah, all right, you know, you know. So uh, what, are you saying you want to do 17th? You're the chair. No, no, well, well, no, we're discussing it. I mean, so, so, and, and certainly if most people want to do the 13th, but I'm just saying the 13th I mean, just gives us two more business days versus the 
to something, even though it sounds like four days, I mean, mm -hmm. two of those days are, are weekend days, I mean, and, and I was gonna say due to 24th as a contingent in case, I mean, the, 24, the 17th just had too much, but if folks are wanting to do the 23rd, I mean, I'm sorry, the 13th, I mean, um, I'm fine with that, you know? Is that okay? I can do any day. Okay, all right, so um, why don't we then do the 13th, I mean, and then, and then a solid 24, you know, and, and we'll come up with something for that 24. You know, I always have ideas. I mean, so, okay, you know, yeah. Are we allowed to wear costumes on the 24th? <laughs> uh, <laughs> appropriate costumes? Mr. Her, you know, I'm easy going. <laughs> you, know, you can wear that costume here or you can do it remotely. No explanations, no excuses necessary, all right? Sounds good. Can I yeah. make a suggestion? We yeah. go all the way till December. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, um, so for um, November, I mean, certainly the having locking in the meeting on the fourteenth makes things easy because for me, I'm thinking the seventh, the seventh, and the twenty-first. Oh, okay. All right. And, and uh, for December, it, it would be the first and the third Mondays. Which I'm forgetting the numbers now. Fifth and nineteen. Five and nineteen. Yeah. Well, Hanukkah starts on the nineteenth, so we should not right. do that. Right, right, so, right. so then we can do. We should we definitely do five, and then what do you want to do besides the nineteenth, which is Monday and Hanukkah? Uh, so, in that week, I mean, any other days will work for me. I won't have the conflict attack. I mean, so. Uh, the that week is usually we start at six o'clock for the second meeting in December. Right. It's usually just really short business that has to get done, procedural things, right. um, and then uh, right. we're done for the evening. So right. so the 21st would work for me better than the 20th. Would that Wednesday work for folks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So what was the first date? Okay. Was it that? So the first date was the 5th. And then the 21st. 21st. And what, what, did the vice chair suggest 6 p.m. for the 21st? It's usually 6 p.m. because then we get our business done by 7, 7, 15-ish, and then so, yeah. we have our... Yeah, we do whatever we, we, we would gathering. Yeah, normally do, you know. Yeah. Is that so, all right? Yeah, yeah, and, and um, I, I do want to say that it, uh, I'm leaning very strongly it, uh, towards uh, meeting remotely in meteorological winter, which is December, January, February, you know. So, so we could discuss that again in November, but I don't want it to be like, wow, a surprise. Yeah, so go ahead, Sandy. Um, Either on the 21st of November or the 5th of December, we'll need to have a uh, tax hearing yeah. to set the tax rate. Yeah. Mm. So um, we will, the staff is meeting now to figure out when they'd be prepared to do that. All right. All right. You know, and we may need to squeeze in a meeting you know, um, at some time, another meeting sometime um, in there if we are going to try to do a joint meeting with the ARB. You know, they are going to be having a retreat or something with the planning director when that person um, comes on board. And then once <coughs> that's kind of worked out, then we'll try and do a joint meeting. You know, it may not happen until January. I hope it happens before then because the school committee wants to meet with us. I think I brought that up. You know, and mm -hmm. and um, initially we were thinking this fall, but but then we had a meeting and it became apparent that that would be better uh, next early next year, and, and so that'll probably be sometime in just, I think right now we're thinking January, you know, but probably February at the latest, but we're not scheduling those now, but just have it in the back of our minds. Yes. If, um, <clears throat> if the chair um, is so inclined, um, we did get a Warren article from John Ward many years ago who was complained, who highlighted that there wasn't enough time for um, residents and others to submit warrant articles and he his warrant article says there should be at least 30 or 31 days and what the board traditionally has done in the past is we all recall is um, we try to give even more than that so what would traditionally happen is um, at our December 5th meeting um, everything that the select board's office and the town manager and town council um, needs to get in a row so that we can have the language on December 5th for uh, opening the warrant. Uh, I would anticipate it's opening the warrant on um, December 5th and um, closing it. Um, traditionally, it's 
I think, been the last Monday in January um, at 4 p.m. Um, so just so I know I'm thinking way far too far ahead, but I just want to make sure that at that December 5th meeting that that is an agenda item. We have the very specific language for, um, and it would just be to open the warrant December 5th and to close it January, whatever that last Monday yes. is at 4 p.m. So yes. thank you. Right, right. Yeah, so, um, so I don't think we need to vote on this. Excuse me. Yeah. So great, excellent. And then, uh, so next is correspondence received. Move receipt. Second. And so a uh, motion of receipt by Ms. Mahan and second by Mr. Helmers. And I think uh, move 12 mean let's send that to TAC. And, uh, and so, um, Mr. Hahn? Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Yes. Great. And so, uh, normally, in the, the um, second open forum is for spillover. Uh, uh, quite, like, not quite sure how I'm going to handle uh, that, but since it's here, the, I'm just going to ask if um, someone in the in the um, virtual realm, he wants to um, say something. <coughs> you see any hands? Seeing no hands. Okay, great. Um, actually, I want to back up just a little bit, you know, on the um, on the meeting. Uh, sometime in in January, to uh, we should think about when we, we regardless of whether we meet virtually only or not, we should think about how we come back in March I mean, and how we incorporate maybe having more people um, in the room. So, so that's a discussion we want to have I mean, sometime earlier in the year. So I just want to get that out there too. I mean, and let people know that we're thinking about that. You know, so, okay. Yeah. Uh, all righty. Uh, so um, new business. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ashley, Ms. Mar, Ms. Mar. <laughs> No new business. Great. You know, Doug? I, I just want to uh, uh, note that uh, one of the members in the legal department is starting on the uh, MMA's municipal certificate program this week, uh, Jessica Sparks, who is our workers' compensation uh, claim coordinator. And so I'm, I'm happy that uh, she's participating in that and grateful to the town for providing uh, the opportunities for uh, continuing education opportunities for uh, its staff. So thank you. Great. Thank you. I would just note that I will be at the ICMA conference in beautiful Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> I know you're all jealous about that. Oh, age, I, oh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Ohio, the, the state that's round at the ends and high in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> I, had, I, had, um, I had not heard that. <laughs> so, I will be there uh, starting Sunday and coming back uh, next Wednesday. Mr. Hurd. I think, Mr. Poole, you're going to find out just how many constituents you have in the next couple of weeks from Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> um, so I don't like to be the complainer in new business, but I came with complaints today. No. So I got, I've got a number of, call, number of calls. A bunch of people stopped me in the streets, and I don't know how many people have approached me about this, but... They recently repaved the area of up where I live on Hillside, and it is when we got notified that we were getting our our streets repaved. We said, "Great, new pavement," and we all had an idea what what it was going to be. And I know this is the old school way of paving, but it was they throw down the tar and they throw down some gravel, and it's essentially. A nightmare right now and I don't think I'm not putting this before the board or the town manager to say go find some money in the budget to do it right or repave it again but I've gotten complaints that there's rocks in dogs paws kids can't use their rollerblades kids can't use their their scooters it's hard to bike it's I scratched my floor because I had a rock stuck in my foot and again, this could be that this is the only way that they we can do it. But my, what I would say 
to whoever the, wherever the decision was made. I don't know who the decision was made. I haven't ma made any investigation of it, and I'm not blaming anyone because, again, I, I grew up and I've seen this in this town before. Is it just doesn't jive with what Arlington currently puts forward as a friendly community for alternative means of transportation. Bicyclists are complaining. Eventually, some of the rocks will compact down. But I got to tell you, it's real. As of right now, it has dramatically <laughs> reduced the use of our streets. We have we don't have a lot of sidewalks up there. The kids bike in the street, scooter in the street, play street hockey, and that's all out for right now. We put the, the rollerblades and the scooters in the back of the garage, and I have probably heard from 25 people about the streets asking if there's going to be a finish code. We've established at this point that there is not going to be. And so it's just for the future, and I think this, and so what everyone said to me, the, the roads are fine. I would much rather of it just stay the way it was, then do this, and it, it, they're not going to be anywhere near the condition they were for years of compaction, if they ever are. And I know this is in response to a lot of the utility work that's been done up in our area, and I know they're doing it all across town. So I would say to the people making the decision, in other areas of the town, it's probably too late for us, but I mean, have a, a little thought about how this is going to affect the alternative man means of transportation that many people use in the area from scooters to e-bikes and the like it, because I have just <laughs> I can't remember anything that's happened in town that has generated more complaints than the repaving of our roads so again I'm not standing here asking to come back and repave our roads I just think as we think about how we do this then look at the cost benefit analysis in the future, there might be a better way. So. And I also do, I was at the Ed Burns Arena today and, and I was very, it's happy to see it's up and running. Hockey has started, skating has started. So that, that's a good positive. The rink was in magnificent shape. So I'm very happy about that. Ended with a positive note. <laughs> Mr. Hellman. I am looking forward to town day, and I'm assuming that the chair may have an update in his new business about that, so I don't need to advertise it beyond beyond that. Um, sure. Thank you. Sure. No, no new business. Uh, Mr. Corsi? Uh, no new business. Uh -huh. um, just two. Um, one very quickly, just a sort of procedural thing. Um, at the next meeting, that works out time-wise, as well as with everybody, all five board members in the town manager in town council but town manager um, if the town manager could speak to our new planning director who I believe has started but maybe she hasn't she, uh, Mr. she starts on the 19th starts on the 19th so whenever you can if you could just talk to her about coming in to meet the board if she's not comfortable in coming in in person yeah. and wants to zoom in that's fine but maybe for the first one um, if, if she does agree to come in, if we can have her really quick, early in the agenda, yeah. so that she's not. But I'll leave that to the chair and town manager to coordinate that. And then um, my other new business, um, which I had conver conversations with the town manager and the <clears throat> deputy town manager, um, and it's just really just an FYI kind of new business. Um, I've heard from quite a few parents. Uh, about positives for the high school, but a lot of them, uh, one parent said to me, there's no bike racks, and three or four different other parents said, there's only one bike rack, it's always full, and um, after my conversation with Mr. Pooler and Mr. Feeney, not on this, on other matters, when I went up the app, I looked as quickly as I could, <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure, and I sent an email to Mr. Pooler and Mr. Feeney saying, you know, I think I see a rack up there, it's full, um, I drove by the high school and every, um, all the frontage al along Mass Ave of the high school has a bike, a scooter, an e-bike leaning against it, which is great, um, but that, that I had received these questions. So they, just so my colleagues know, they got back to me that 
coincidentally, and I did not know this, um, Mr. Feeney had a meeting with the uh, assistant principal at the high school, and I, I'm blanking on his or her name, today, um, there were 115 uh, bikes, scooters, and e-bikes up there. Um, and Mr. Poole can correct me if I'm wrong, there's one um, bike rack that's been installed and planned for that holds 20 bikes, um, and there's one uh, down by school or court, um, but they counted, of the 115, there's really only spots for 20, and where they're going now, the bikes, they're being tethered to anything that's out there. So the benches, which I totally understand, I'm not complaining about that, so. Um, they are uh, looking at, um, but they have to get approval from the uh, general contractor on the site. There's two bike racks down at, on, I think on Ryder Street that DPW has that can be put in there. There will be more put in in the future, but um, I believe one of the reasons for the meeting this morning was they didn't anticipate um, for the scooters, the, the bike racks that we have don't accommodate them. Could you want to fill this in better for me, Mr. Pooler? I'd be glad to speak if you'd like, but yes. you are doing a great job. Oh, you go ahead. Please. All right. Sorry. So, that's all right, Mr. Oh, Chair. That's fine. Mr. Chair, uh, many members, as part of the whole high school project, uh, there are a lot more bike racks in the plan. Many of them were scheduled to be put in behind the school when we put in that new uh, bike extension that will connect to the Minuteman bikeway. There's a whole big area of bike racks that's supposed to go in there. And I think what happened is just the building of the school and the full usage of it didn't sync up with what the total plan was. So uh, Mr. Feeney has been very active talking to Phil McCarthy about um, the vice principal of the high school. Uh, about um, getting some more bike racks in there. He's looking for those. And I think that there's a realization now, as uh, Ms. Mahan said, that um, we need to do something with these scooters because we thought about bikes, but we didn't really think about scooters. Um, I don't know what the answer to that is gonna be yet, um, but I have every confidence that Mr. Feeney will be on top of that and we'll have some solutions. So I think that is the situation. Um, and I think you'll see more racks going in there soon. And I know it's school and we're the town side, but I just wanted to make sure that we're all aware of that because I know once we all start hitting games down there, you'll probably get the same question just to give the information that um, it's a work in progress and it will be addressed. So thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chair. That's it. That's fine. Great. Thank you. You know, so yeah, uh, my new business, you know, first is uh, you might have seen an article uh, in your Arlington regarding balloons. That I don't know. I don't know how that got there because the only reason I sent that email uh, to Bob uh, Sprague was because he was included in the list of people who had requested a helium tank. I did not expect my letter to end up in your well, Arlington. I'm sorry, I didn't. I missed. The oh, email. it was just a letter uh, respectfully requesting the people who who asked for helium tanks to secure their balloon, balloons to me. So oh, that, balloons, yeah, balloons. I've noticed yeah. I have Yeah, well, I'm speaking through a mask, okay. too, me, so, sorry. so sorry, sorry about that, you know. Uh, and uh, so, so you know, <laughs> I'm just saying that because I think I'm also talking to, to, to Bob or at least someone from New Orleans, and it wasn't meant to be published. It's fine that it is me, but I wasn't sending it with, with that intent, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, looks like the weather's gonna be great for um, for, for Tom Day, you know. Uh, and, and um, and and um, it, gosh, I don't know how to say this. Um, it, you know, your, your health is your responsibility. I mean, uh, we get all kinds of readings from you know the CDC, but in the end, it's your responsibility. I mean, so so um, it, for those of you inclined, I mean, take a look at the biobot data. You know, um, try to take out that big spike from Omicron and just gauge where things are. And, you know, I mean, do what you think is, is in your best interest, whether that's wearing a mask while outdoors, I mean, or, or spending less time, you know, whatever, you know, there will be more town days, you know, and so, so I just put that out there, you know, because um, as you can see, I'm a little, a little conservative um, when it comes to that. So. Um, uh, and um, and on the last note, it um, is bittersweet. It, um, and so, um, in regards to 
regards to three deaths. I mean, um, one was the mayor of New Orleans, I mean, uh, Moon Landrieu. Uh, uh, my mom loved him. I mean, um, and I mean, the more I understand about, know what he did, I mean, he was really, he, uh, he was big on desegregation I mean, back in the, the, um, the late 60s, or 60s and, and um, 70s. And, and um, I went to school with two of his sons, I mean, uh, his, his older son, the oldest son I went to school with, and actually ended up being the mayor of New Orleans, and one of his younger sons was in my class, I mean, really, really nice people. Uh, the other is the Queen of England, I mean, and I say that as a transition to the matriarch of my partner's household, you know, his mom passed away. Mm -hmm. it, uh, actually turns out it was on the day before Labor Day. It, uh, uh, she was discovered the day after, uh, and which was a little long, longish period of time, considering how much his sister he, and he spoke with her. I mean, uh, I mean, multiple times a day. I mean, uh, and, and so they were very close, and it got even closer after uh, their father died. He, uh, and whereas they loved both parents, the affection for their mom he, was really deep. And so, and so they're both having a hard time. And, uh, and, and so hey, I was away I me mean, for nearly a week. I mean, and so. So I'm behind on everything, you know, but I'm going to catch up, you know, because life goes on, you know, and that's the, we have to go on, you know, and the fact that they loved her so much is why they miss her so much. And so that's the bittersweet uh, part of it. So, so, um, you know, you know. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. Please extend our yeah, yeah, sure. to your partner. Yeah, right. Well, you know, so Mr. Hurt. Yeah. Sorry for your loss, of course, and to you and your family. Um, I just want, if you can I add one more thing to yeah. new business. On town day, Mr. Feeney asked us to say this, and I totally forgot. Just a reminder that the fireworks are on Saturday this year, not Friday. We, they've generally been on Friday. So they'll be on Saturday as a culmination of town day with the hope that people will go to town day, go pat patronize our local businesses. The beer garden will still be open. All our wonderful restaurants will be open, and it's a good place to eat and then walk down to and check out the fireworks. So those are going to be on Saturday around 8 o'clock. It's kind of a floating time, but they say at dusk. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. So there is just one more motion to entertain. Move to adjourn. Mrs. Mahan. And Second. By Mr. Hurd. And, and Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Helmer. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes, thank you. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Shannon. Thank you. Thank you.